Jesus, somebody give him praise. Come on, stand up. If you believe in the God of freedom, somebody give him praise. Stand up. If you believe in the name of Jesus, somebody give him praise. Stand up. If you believe that his word is final, somebody give him praise. Stand up. If you believe in a new revival, somebody give him praise. Stand up. If you believe the Spirit's moving, somebody give So this morning, we're going to be sharing a, a new song with you guys this, this morning, and um, it's written by a man called Heath Botsley. And he said, at the beginning of the pandemic, so many of the old songs, hymns, um, just classics that he grew up with began resurfacing in his soul again, and he said it anchored his heart to hope. And he said, that's where this song comes from. And as we sing it, you're going to see that. There's a number of hymns that are written throughout it, um, songs like Blessed Assurance and It Is Well With My Soul. And I think it's just amazing that with hymns of praise, psalms of hope and joy and grief or sorrow, we can all just sing those songs from, from generations past, yes. still singing them today as one church in Jesus. So um, we're going to sing the sing the chorus real quick so that way you guys can get a hang of it. Goes like this. In Christ alone my solid crown amazing grace yeah how sweet the sound on that rugged cross Jesus paid it all because he lives. This is my song. And I remember 
the helpless find hope. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. The doors fling wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. Yeah. And miracles take place, the cynical find I could tell you, wish I could describe it, but I can't contain it, I can't keep it to myself. There aren't enough colors to paint the whole picture, not enough words to ever say what I found. Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy, he is merciful and of notes to make the harmony. It's the song of the angels, angels. all of the ages, angels. all of the earth and heaven. Symphony! That's my God, that's my shepherd, my protector, that's my king, that's my rock, that's my anchor, my defender. We give him all 
Well, all right, all right. Good morning, everybody. Man, we got a saying in the South about worship like that. It says, if that don't light your fire, your wood's wet. Man, that was some awesome worship. Praise God. Well, my name is Jimmy. I'm the pastor of recovery and marriage here. Woo, go Jimmy. Yeah, and I'm so glad you guys are here. If you're joining us for the first time, if you're online or in person, uh, there is a QR code that you can scan to find out more about Crossroads. It's on your screen for the online people and it's on the back of the chair in front of you. You can scan that QR code and go to all kinds of information about Crossroads. Also, if you're on site, out these doors is a welcome center and you can stop by there as well. There's a ton of people there just ready to answer your questions, uh, pray with you, tell you all about Crossroads, all about what's going on around here because there is a lot going on around here at Crossroads. For example, August 9th is our third annual Ready, Set, Engage date night. Yeah, we're so, two people are clapping. Yes, we're so excited about it. Listen, it's going to be a fun night. If you're, if you're um, married or dating, you're invited to come. Stop by our uh, uh, table out there. we got more information. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be a scavenger hunt road rally. Okay, it's going to be an awesome night, but we're going to start out with a great dinner. We're going to cater a barbecue dinner, right? And outside at our table, we're going to have samples, barbecue samples on toothpicks. So get them while they last. It's really good. It's our way of bribing you to sign up, just full transparency, right? It's going to be a really great time. The cost is 50 bucks a couple, which is cheap date night uh, by today's standards. It's going to be a good time. And so uh, check it out. You can also get a card at the table. It looks like this. It has a QR code on the back. You can scan it. Or you can go to crossroadsgrace.org slash date night uh, to find out more about it. But you're not going to want to miss it. And because of your faithful giving around here, your generous giving, that enables us to do things like this, to help marriages, to help build families that way. And so we're really thankful for your giving. And we want to invite you to our annual business meeting on August 11th at 2 p.m. Now, if you can't make it, you can join online. That's super cool. And so it's a really great time for a business meeting, right? Because we get to celebrate what God's doing through Crossroads. And it's so exciting. We get to hear the ministry plans for the next year. We get to see the proposed budget for the next year. But it's really all about celebrating what God is doing at Crossroads. And so come on, it's a good time. And I would love to have you. Now, also this weekend is Benevolence weekend, right? Benevolence is our way to stretch our, our resources out into the community to help people in need. So we have some team members in the back that have some baskets, and if you're able to, if you want to put a little extra in on your way out, every dollar that goes in that basket goes out the door into the community. It's our way of reaching the people in the community that have needs any way that we possibly can, but it's more importantly, it's about us showing the love of Christ and us showing the gospel to people in the community, and you have a direct part of that every time you uh, contribute to our benevolence. And so it's really, really important. Now, we're gonna jump into our message. We're gonna jump into the rest of the uh, service, but I wanna ask you if you would pray with me right now. So can we bow our heads and pray together? Father God, we are in awe of you. You are our king. You are our everything, and Father, we thank you for your love and mercy for us. Now, God, we ask that you would prepare our hearts and our minds, that you would open our minds and open our hearts to what you have to say to us today. We are here for you, and Lord, we are ready to receive what you have for us. So God, thank you. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for everybody that contributes to to doing these services and in every way, God. But Lord, it's all for you. And we give you the glory and we give you the praise and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. 
So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him out to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomachs with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Well, good morning, and uh, just to start us off here, just real quick, uh, does, does anybody remember having a best friend, like, growing up? Anybody, rem- like, have a best friend? Maybe you have one now, you know? And I know you call things differently, things now, like, there's the, the besties, and some people call them their pookie, and then you have your BFF, or the boys, if you're the guys, or the, your twin, like, whatever, and, and then you, you have, like, different stuff that you share with one another. You have, like, the, the bracelet thing, and you have the heart necklace where you bring them together, and we're one. Like, you know, that whole thing, or you get a tattoo with your best, right? But, but regardless of what you call them or what little shenanigan thing that you wear with it, do you have a person that's like, like a best friend to you? Somebody that's closer than, than anybody else in the world. Um, I grew up with that. I was fortunate to have that. My best friend, his name was Rob with two Bs. Uh, always wanted to make sure there's two Bs on it, whatever. But Rob was my best friend. And honestly, we were joined at the hip. And it was just some weird things, like the way that we kind of connected. He was at 1200 Kings Court. I was at 1200 Kings Road, the same development. Uh, his mom drove a burgundy Oldsmobile station wagon. My mom drove the same burgundy Oldsmobile station wagon. We drove to school together. We played sports together. We would drive home every day after high school, and we would eat ravioli out of a can and watch the Mighty Morphin's Power Rangers, okay? That is next-level friendship when that's happening, okay? Uh, We worked at the Armadillo's Ice Cream Shop together in, in Rapid City, and we did landscaping together and had to take on... Anyway, we did all kinds of stuff together. It was, it was amazing. But no matter where we went, that I was, we were always there together almost every single part of the day. We, we would grow up together, and, and even though uh, we've been, we're apart, we've been apart for a really long time, uh, I still consider Rob my, my dearest, dearest friend in the entire world, and, and he, he, he was my best friend. And I remember my mom saying this to us growing up. She says to my other brothers, man, I just hope that you guys find your Rob when you grow up, like when in, in your life, because we were, we were that close. I mean, best friends, close friends, they're really important in, in our life. And however, the, the, the growing reality in our country, and dare I say even in our world, is that that is far from the norm for us to have, have, to have that. Because whereas our parents and our grandparents, they would know everybody in their neighborhood and they would be hanging out all the time. What what do we do now? Here's what we do. We drive home and we go into our garages. We turn off the car. We shut the door before we ever get out because we never want anyone to know that we're there. We create these cocoons of privacy that are impenetrable. Which is ironic because on the other side, there is really zero filter that we have with digital relationships. And we're telling everybody everything online, but we never want to be known by anybody in person. And so while we might stand on our mountain of pride convincing ourselves that, you know, I'm okay with this, it it, it does lead to something. It leads to extreme loneliness. Here's some uh, interesting statistics that I found, actually, that one-third of adults aged 45 and older feel lonely. Three in 10 Americans report feeling lonely at least once every day. One in five practicing Christians feels lonely each day. Loneliness is associated with higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. And social isolation or loneliness was associated with a 29% increase in the risk of heart disease, 
and a 32% increase at the risk of stroke. And, and while you might like nod your heads in agreement at that, um, and as we look at the landscape of our world, we would say, yeah, that probably makes sense. As Christians, we're not off the hook when it comes to that. We are called by God to not only to be in community, but to actually seek out community in our life. Our lives were absolutely never meant to be lived alone. We were meant to live in circles with one another. And, and this is why God created the world. And when he said it was, he said it's not very good until God gave Adam a helpmate in Eve. Which, which should show us that, that, there, that we are better in a pack of, of people, not a pack of aardvarks, but like a pack of people together, that we are there together to, to thrive with one another. So it's why God would say that it's, it's good for people to get married and, and, and to do that. So in Genesis, we get to read where God says it is not good for a man, excuse me, it's, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Solomon would say over in the book of Ecclesiastes, he would say two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. In fact, that very same Solomon, the richest and wisest man that ever lived, he would go so far as to say that not having a relationship or relationships with others leads to it being meaningless, that your life is meaningless. And it's all because of this very fundamental fact about every person that's ever been created. And that is that God created you to live life with others. God created you to live life with others. There is a deep longing inside each of us to be known and to know other people. And, and as much as we might want to you know, push back on that and say, you know what, I just want to be left alone. I'm an introvert, Pastor Brian, just leave me alone. In reality, we were made to, to be with other people on some level. But, but there is a very important type of relationship that, we are, uh, with, that we're supposed to have with, with other people. One that goes beyond just having drinking buddies and girls trips and bingo club nights. God has wired us for a relationship that goes beyond those things in some very, very important ways. So, so I want to try to show that to you today. And I'm going to use a story in the Bible that, that, that if you grew up in church, you've heard this story before. But even if you didn't grow up in church, you probably have heard that story, this story before. We had it just read just a second ago. It's known as the prodigal son. It's one of Jesus' most famous parables he ever told. And, and to remember, a parable is a made-up story by Jesus designed to tell us a very important truth. So, so I want us to read this parable again today, but I want us to consider a different angle to it, one that you might not have considered before. So we'll begin in Luke chapter 15. So if you have your Bibles or your Crossroads Grace apps, you can open up to Luke chapter 15. In Luke 15, we're going to start at verse 11, and it says this, there was a man, this is Jesus speaking, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So here, here's what we have. The parable gets set up. Jesus says, hey, there's a dad. He's got a couple kids, two, two sons. And he says, of all the people, the younger son says, you know what? Dad, I'm, I'm, I've had enough. I, I, I want out. Always the younger kid causing all the problems. But anyway, that's a different story, right? But he, he's like, I, I want out. And he says, I want my inheritance. He says, I want my money, daddy. I want my money. And if we really were to cut to the chase as it related to the story, he was telling his dad, hey, dad, I wish you were dead. It's the only way he was going to get his money. And inheritance is when the father dies, right? So, which all of you, if you were the dad in that moment, you would look over to that young kid and say, <laughs> zip it, Skippy, get back to work. Right? That's what we would say. Like, I'm not going to give you my money now. Because in order to give the son what he wanted, he would have literally had to sell part of his land to get the money to give to his son. There was no line of credit back in the day, like you couldn't go to your bank to try to afford, no, 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 you need money and you need real money. So the chances of him agreeing, the dad to agreeing to this kind of crazy request is absolutely absurd. I mean, who in their right, no one would ever have that happen. Like why, why would you ever want it to do that as a, as a businessman and as a father? Now, here is where I think I want us to start to think of the story in a new way, though. And, and again, let's consider, this is a parable told by Jesus, okay? It's a made-up story to tell a real truth. But I just want to 
allow ourselves in the middle of this parable to possibly think about a logical conclusion that could be drawn from this, this scenario that happened. This, this young man comes to this father and he asks for his inheritance to go so he could live his life however he wanted to live it. So to me, there is no way that this happens like by, by completely by accident, you know, or, or that, that he cooked up this idea all by himself. He didn't wake up one day and say, okay, what am I going to do today? I don't know. Oh, you know what? I'm going to go ask my dad to go die so I can have his inheritance and I can just go do some things. No, no, it just didn't happen that way. Like most likely what happens is my guess would be is that he probably had some people around him that put some ideas in his head because of their own brokenness and their own sinfulness, and he wanted them to, to join them. He wanted, they wanted him to join them in their brokenness together. And this happens all the time. There's these ideas that start to be, that, that are given to us, and they, they come to our mind and into our hearts, and all of a sudden we start to think, well, that's the only way this is going to work. It's the only way to go. You, you know what this is about. It's, it's that girl at work that says, you know what? Your, your wife is not all that attentive to you. I, I'd never do that to you if you were my man. It's that, it's that coworker that says, you know, this company is so big and so they would never even notice if you put a few extra dollars on your expense report. It's your friend that comes to you and says, hey, you know what? Your, your parents are way too strict, man. Hey, let's lie to them. Let's go out and hang out on the weekend. We're going to have some real fun. Just forget about them. It's these seeds of dissension that are, that are put into your heart that slowly grow into some terrible choices and terrible ideas. And isn't it funny that it all starts with a community that you keep? Paul says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, read it a couple of weeks ago, do not be misled, but bad company corrupts good character. So, so in all this talk about community that we're going to have today and the people around us, we need to be mindful of first of who we are allowing to be in our community. Because if bad company corrupts good character, then you should probably be wise that you should keep good company and not have toxic community around you. In, in our story, it could be that initially this young man just had a bunch of people and some young guys around him that said, hey, dude, you got, your dad's got some money. I think you should get some of it right now. And so this mob of bad company convinces him to say, hey, dad, I want my money, and I want my money now. And, and amazingly, Jesus says this is what the father does. It, it, he says, so he divided his property between them. The father does it. He liquidates the assets that are associated to his son's portion of the inheritance, and he gives it to him. And here is where we can start to think, which is why I think how this son was affected by these outside influences. And the reason I can tell you that is because of what he did with the money. Look at what he did with the money. Continue to read. It says, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. He, he says that he takes the money, he heads off to live the way that he just wanted to live his entire life. He took off and then he just did it up, man. He, he, he took maybe some of his buddies that were in town and he headed off and he went headlong into the arms of the world and it was waiting to just embrace him and hug him tight. And it said, don't you love it? It said that he spent his money on what? Wild living. You, you, you can fill in the blanks on what you think wild living is, but I'll assure you that he wasn't sitting around playing cornhole with his buddies planning, planning his next missions trip. It wasn't what he was doing. They were up to no good, and the Benjamins, whoo, they were just flying out, baby, right? Right, let it rain, right? Prodigal is in the house, here we go. And, and as we come back to this idea of community, here's, here's what I can tell you without any question whatsoever. It was not hard for him to find people to be around him when he was living his best life now. I mean, the money was flowing, the drinks were flowing, and the fun was funning. I don't even know if that's a word, but you know what I mean? Like, it was, the things were happening. Because who doesn't want to be around somebody when life is good? And, and the same is true for you, isn't it? 
when the job is great and the kids are succeeding and your girlfriend's awesome to be around and you got, and you got into the school of your dreams, man, those are the times when people are chomping at the bit to hang out with you. I mean, it's easy to have people around you when things are going good, isn't it? You have besties everywhere when that stuff is happening. And, and I think that's great. I, I think that's not a bad thing. Having people near you when you're, you're enjoying things that are happening in your life and you could be, you know, let your hair down. I've, I've heard that that happens. Like you let your hair down around those people. That's a good thing. But here's what I just believe. The more that I just have been living, here's what I believe more than anything. Good times are not the true test of a friend. They're just not. I mean, come on, let, let's be real. When things are going good, I'll tell you what, I am a great friend when things are going really good. But it's the other times, the harder things, the times when you're not at your best, the times when things are really difficult and more than just having a bad hair day, the times that are bigger than, man, your contacts are hurting your eyes and so you have to wear your nighttime glasses outside, like bigger things than that. I'm talking about days when you are unemployed, when you break up, when your health starts to fail, the uncertainty about the future, I'll tell you what, those are the times when it can be easy for the party friends to scatter like cockroaches when the lights come on. And this is exactly what happened to the prodigal. Look, look closely, look back at verse 14 with me. Verse 14 says, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Isn't it funny, right? Isn't it funny that all those people that were probably his best friends, they scattered when the money dried up. When the party was over, so was the friendship. But, but isn't it true that that's that's when you need people the most? When the boyfriend breaks up with you out of nowhere. When you're fired from the job. When your child gets sick. When the depression sets in again. We need people that are not just going to be there for the party, but for the poopy, is what I would say. We need them for both. We need friends that are, that are, that are like what Solomon would describe in, in Proverbs chapter 17. He would say it this way. He would say, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. This is the type of friend, the type of community that we need to have. Friends that will love you at all times, even in adversity. But in order to do that, we have to put ourselves in positions where we ourselves can be around people like that. People that can live life with us and shed tears with us. Learn about Jesus together and learn about each other. Be there during the best and the worst moments of our life. And that happens when we put ourselves around other people that love Jesus and are willing to stick it out even when times get tough. S Solomon would say this a little bit later in, in Proverbs chapter 18. He would say, uh, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. That's true. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. See, that's why I love that the prodigal story doesn't end in the pig pen. It doesn't end with him in the slop because they're, the next six words that we're going to hear are so powerful because I think these are six words that all of us at one point in our life really say if we really think about it. It says this. It says, when he came to his senses. He comes to his senses after his life falls apart and he finds himself in the worst position in his entire life and when that happens, he does not look inside himself for strength, but he realizes that there is something else that he could do. Another way at looking at what he was going through, and that, that's where we get to see the rest of it. It says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have found food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, he says, listen, I got to go back home. I, I, I got to go back home. I need to get back to my community. But yet, even though he knows that that's where he needs to be, he still has some guilt that he needs to deal with. He, he wants to come home, but he feels like 
you know, I need to do something to show that I've changed, or I'm at least willing to humble myself in the embarrassment that I've caused this family. And so even though he knows where he needs to go, he feels like he needs to, to do something. And that's where, it, this is what he comes up with. He says, and he says to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. Comes up with this speech that he feels is gonna let him fall on the sword, on a sword in front of his father and, and hopefully be able to just, just at least work with him again. He, he's okay not even being called his son anymore, but he just wants to be back where, where, where he was safe and, and he could live again. But here's the problem with that. You might think, well, that's just, that's exactly what you should do. That's probably what I would do. Here's the problem with that. That's not true community. That, what he's describing, that's community with strings attached. That's a community of qualifiers. That's a community that loves you in your best, but disregards you during your worst. That's not a community that is centered around the love of God. And thankfully, thankfully for that young man, the father was not like that. We continue, it says this. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. I love this. The father sees his son far off, which by the way, the only way that you see someone far off is if you were looking for him, intently looking for him. And he finally spots him. And what does he do? He sprints towards him with zero regard for cultural decorum or public embarrassment. All he cares about, I gotta get to my son. And he doesn't care about where he's been. He just cares about where he is right now. And yes, this story is 100% designed to be about us coming back to God as our father, running from our sin back into his arms. It's a story of all of us clinging to Jesus as our savior no matter what we've done. But it should also remind us about the love of the father, that safe, welcoming community, that welcoming him back home. And so what does the father do? He hugs him and he hugs him and he hugs him Pig smell and all, he doesn't care, he just hugs him and he kisses his son. But you can almost imagine it happening that as this embrace is happening, his father is holding him, all of a sudden the, the warm feeling of I'm glad to be home, the son is reminded of all that he's done and so he feels awkward and he, he embarrassed and so he kind of almost pushes himself away from his father and he goes into his speech and he says, the son said to him, father, Sin against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father, he'd have none of it. None of it. He cuts him off mid-sentence and looks at what he says. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. The father embraces him back into his own. Instead of choosing to interrogate him, he chooses to celebrate him. Kills the fatted calf, puts a robe on his shoulders, a ring on his finger, puts sandals on his worn feet. In the middle of the worst moment of his life, at this prodigal's lowest moment, this son had people that were there to bring him back and lift him up. Don't you love that it says that, that they began to celebrate? He came back to community. The people that loved him. Charles Dickens once said in his most famous book of all times, A Tale of Two Cities, Britain in 1859, it begins by saying it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And that line has transcended the, those pages to define the reality of your life and my life. We all have best times, but we all have worst times in our life. And sadly, most of us go through those worst times alone and without other people around us. We feel like we're invincible. We don't need other people around. I'm just gonna do it myself. But God is so good that he clears the air, isn't it? He says, no, 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 that's not how you do it. We need each other. 
Maybe a, maybe a super fun way to say it is that we need besties that are there for the worsties. <laughs> I know, I lost my man card, guys. I'm sorry, right? But that's like I did it, like we need it. But, but here's what we need. We need people to go to the games with, but to go to the funeral home with. We need people to learn about Jesus with. We need people to laugh with and to cry with. We need people to hold us accountable to our walk with Christ. We need people that we could ask questions to and also people that give us advice. We need people to tell us to tell us when they're frustrated with what is happening with God, but also there to say, I'm so overwhelmed with his love too. We need each other, y'all. We need each other. Because here is what God is telling us. He's saying, godly community is for the best and the worst of life. We need community and friendship with us through the best and through the worst in our lives. So let me get really practical with you. This week, I want you to reread what we just did. Reread Luke 15, the whole thing. You can read the whole thing, but really focus on the prodigal story. But then the second thing I want you to do, ask this question. Who do you have for the best and worst in your life right now? Who do you have? And even if you have it, and even if you don't, I want, you to, I want everybody to do the last thing. I want you to sign up for a growth group. I want you to get involved in the community right here at Crossroads. And I'm just going to be annoying. I'm going to tell you all about them for a second. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So I got the mic and you don't. And so here, on your seat, you got this when you came in. The first thing I'm going to challenge you to do is I want you to sign up to actually lead a growth group. I want you to sign up to maybe open your home and provide some time to lead a growth group to create some community around you. Now, now be careful. I'm not saying that you're 100% going to get your best friends of all time. Like, I'm not going to say that this is going to happen. That's not fair. But I want you to get some people around you, get some community going. And maybe you need to start off by leading one of these groups and starting to get some community around you right now. To talk about Jesus, yes, but to talk about life also. So for you, maybe you need to start too. We need 20 more. 20 more hosts to be a part of our growth groups this fall. I'm challenging you to step up and do that. You can use the QR code right here. The other thing is, I'll tell you about some of the groups. If you haven't, if you don't want to start, I want you to join a group. Get involved in a group. Pastor Jimmy just talked to you about re-engage our marriage ministry. It is unreal. You should be a part of it. If you are married, get involved. We're bribing you with tri-tip and meat. What else do you want? Like, go out there and get a part of re-engage. It has transformed people's marriages. Get involved with that. Get some community around you. If you are wanting to get your finances in order to spend God's money God's way and have it not own you, get in Financial Peace University. If you have not taken this class yet, it it is vital for every single person to do this so you don't get caught in the, in the traps of debt and you can live financially free. Get involved in that. Get community around you as you do it. Rooted is our class that helps you take your next step toward Christ to be able to help you be rooted and have experiences to know how to follow Jesus better. Rooted is an amazing class. If you've yet to do that, take Rooted. Get involved in that. We've got multiple offerings for that. Did you know that we're, our next week we start a brand new series on the book of Romans and we're going to be having groups that are going to be going through Romans together so you can sign up for a Romans growth group for that. We would love for you to do that. There's some exciting things next week. You want to be a part of that. Make sure you're here next week for the Romans kickoff. But join in one of those groups. High school students, uh, if you didn't know, there's a Romans, I, I should say this high school group, there is high school groups that are going through the Bible, reading, taking next steps with that that you can be a part of that you can dive in and be a part of our next generation. But not only high school, young adults, 18 to 25, you can connect with one another, and we've got a great young adult group that's starting to really, it's really great, gaining a lot of steam. We want you to be a part of that. Get community around you at one of the most important times of your life. But what I'm bottom line saying is sign up for a group. Get involved in a group, in community this fall. Make it a point so you have people during the best and the worst times of your life, and make it a point. Because I could tell you, that I know firsthand how important that is in my life. So let me just leave you with this. I'll tell you a bit of a story. I remember it like it was literally yesterday. May 8th, 2009, 7.03 p.m., Christ Hospital, Chicago, Illinois. My baby girl, Aniston, she had just been born after years of my wife praying and crying and seeking God's favor. <laughs> she, was, she was finally, finally here. And, and Sheree and I, we were, we were so grateful to God that he had answered our prayers and our baby girl was finally here. And, and I can remember that after Aniston was born and she was on like that little warming table and I got to cut the umbilical cord, 
And I watch the nurses clean her up and, and take care of her and put her under, under the lamps. But as I started to, to stare at this beautiful miracle in front of me, I could start to tell that there was something that wasn't normal. I could tell that she was, that she was summoning every, every microscopic muscle that she could muster in her tiny, tiny body just to be able to breathe just, just a little bit. And, and this beautiful baby that was once pink with color all of a sudden started to turn very blue and, and very purple. And it was then that, that dad got moved out of the way and the doctors rushed in. And, and as fast as they could, they took my, my beautiful baby girl, my miracle, and they went through the doors on the left. There, there, no more than a couple minutes of her being in this wonderful world and coming into the, onto the world stage. All of a sudden, she's rushed away and the medical staff just take her. And there was no snuggle moment. There was no cuddle pictures at the bedside with Cherie and I. It was just a wave of concern and, and look on the medical team's faces as if they were telling us that everything was not okay. And so they took my little Aniston and they left these two scared parents, confused, first time mom and dad not knowing what was going on. And that moment began a two week stay in the neonatal intensive care unit for my baby girl. She, she was intubated to let her lungs develop. They were monitoring her with every little microscopic breath that she took because her lungs just weren't ready. She came too early and so now we're going to have to see God work with her on the outside of Sheree. But instead of seeing this happen through ultrasound pictures, we were going to be at her bedside. Instead of this picture-perfect ending of the three of us driving home and leaving the, the hospital after a couple of days, I remember Sheree and I drove home alone, leaving our little baby girl to fight for her life. And, and we didn't say very much on that drive home because that, the cab of that car was, mixed, was a mixture of sadness and anger and frustration and confusion and disbelief. How could this be our life? How could we have, have after all we've gone through, God, how could this be? For almost 14 days, we drove the 45 minutes one way to spend that 12 hours that we had, and we never left her side, not once. Now, our dog Pacino was a little ticked off with this whole thing, and he, uh, he, he definitely ate through a couple of rolls of toilet paper just as a, as a way of boycotting and telling us what he thought of the whole thing. We, we understand that. But I could say... I can say without any doubt that both Sheree and I would say that those were the worst moments of our lives. Seeing your little baby girl struggle just to breathe. Having to, having to hold her head still. And I remember whispering to her, Daddy's here, Daddy's here. So that she wouldn't struggle and create more CO2, which would prevent her from being able to get her her oxygen levels down and praying that she would just eat just a little bit more so her, her body weight would come up and, 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 and nervously coming in each morning just wondering how did the night go? How are things? And guys, even now, 15 years later, I still get a tear in my eye thinking back to those moments. It all floods back. It was the worst time of my life. And when you're at your worst, oftentimes the worst comes out of you. I, I was angry with God. I was confused. I was frustrated. I had no idea. Why would you do this? Why would you take her from us like this? And it was this moment that I, that I never want to go back to, yet I never want to forget either. Because I can tell you that if we did not have our relationship with Jesus Christ and people in our lives that loved us, I'm not sure where we'd, where we'd be. Our, our small group from church became some of the closest friends that we've ever had. Guys, they were there with us at the hospital. They drew pictures for us. They were on the phone with us. They made more meals than was appropriate for us. We just love them. Our, our senior pastor from our church, he came, and, and Pastor Tim Harlow, one of my dearest friends, he would come, and the CEO of the actual hospital that we were at attended our church, and he assured that Anison got the very best care possible. 
By the way, if you want to see one of the coolest things in the world, have the CEO of the hospital come to your department and watch how the staff respond. It is amazing. I remember calling my brothers and just yelling in frustration and they didn't have to say a thing. I remember my staff taking care of things in the campus. We had people that were there for us, who cared for us, no matter what, even at our worst. Which is why they were some of the first people that we got to celebrate when, when we brought Aniston home. That they were, they were there during the best days of our life when God allowed this little miracle girl to bust out of that NICU and come home where she belonged. Even Pacino came around and started to like her a little bit too, but but I need to tell you this. That strong community was not just there in that moment. They were there when we were to live life together. We vacationed together. We had dinners together. We, we studied and learned about Jesus together. They were people that were there during the best and during the worst. We were, we were more than blessed and grateful for those folks in our life. And that's why we're so grateful that that little baby girl is now growing and 15 and doing amazing. But, but I can tell you that even though we are uh, half a country away from them, we are still more connected than ever. And we love them because they were there for us during the best and during the worst. I, I want this for our church. I, I want this for you. I want this for your family. I want this for your growth in Jesus. I want this so that you can know what it's like to follow Jesus, not just by yourself, but with a group of people that are with you through the very best and the very worst of your life. Because godly community is for the best and the worst in life. And I will tell you this. The only way that you can have that type of community is if it's rooted in who Jesus Christ is. That if you, you believe that he is who he says he is, he's the savior of the world, he's the savior of your life, that you're growing in community together. And that doesn't mean that you're always happy and everything's okay, but it means that you have people with you through the best and the worst, and you come back to Jesus as the center point of why you do everything that you do, good or bad. And so as we center our lives back to the most important community that we can have, and that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. He then tells us that after you accept him, you should then surround yourself with others so you live this life together and not alone. And I just know that in a room this size and those joining us, that there's a lot of people here that are feeling pretty alone. And you're wondering, like, how do I get what you're, at, what you're talking about, PV? And I would tell you the way that you do that is, number one, you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that he is your primary relationship over anything else. And then number two, you stop believing the lies that Satan is telling you, that you have to go through life by your own, that you've got to figure it out by yourself, that you, are, that you are better if you're tougher on your own. Don't believe any of that garbage, and you start to get in community. You start to make every excuse possible why you need to have a community around you, not why you don't have time to do it. And we want to help you do that. We want to help you through growth groups. We want to help you with your walk. But we want you to know it's all about Jesus. His amazing grace that saved a wretch like me, his amazing grace is what brings us together through the best and through the worst of our life. And so as we come to this time of communion, I would just ask that you would take that communion that you had, got when you walked in, and if you have something at home right now, that you would get it. And that, that we would remember that this bread is is more than just like a little snack time. This is actually so important. This is the time where we remember that how much Jesus loves us, that he would have his body broken for us so that we could be broken together as a community of believers. So we take this bread and we eat in remembrance of Jesus now. And this juice reminds us of the shed blood of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and whose blood covers over all of our sin, all of our shame, all of our guilt, makes us white as snow found in him. And it's the reason, and it's the proof, I should say, of why he wants us to have him as our number one relationship, because he loves us this much, that he would lay down his life for you and for me. And then Jesus would say, no greater love is than this, that they would lay down their life for one another. That's what's called community. 
being there for one another, living life together. So community is a remembering of Jesus, and we remember Jesus through this juice that we take in remembrance of him. Now, in a second, we're going to have a song that's going to be sung, and um, I'm going to have you stand in a moment to receive it. But as you do that, I want you to, to not rush out and to leave and to say, I'm going to get to my car. I want you to soak this in and allow yourself to consider what God is calling you to do and then act upon it. I want you to act on this idea of community and make it a priority in your life through the best and through the worst because that is exactly what God wants for us. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for this moment that we just simply sit in awe of you and say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for showing us that even you lived in community. You had 12 guys around you that held closer, three that were even closer than that, one that was closer than anything else. Father, thank you for that example that you give us through Christ. But would you help us not to be so arrogant to think that we could do this by ourselves, but that we would be quick to lean into others through the best and through the worst. And so I thank you that you would allow us to hear from you and to think, think about this amazing grace you offer us, but the amazing opportunity that we have to live this life together and not alone. And may we do something with what we've heard today. And may we trust that you are good and that life is better together. We love you and thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Stand to your feet. Receive this song. Be encouraged as you leave today. some community and tag your it.